Okay, fine. Um, I'm in. But we'll we can go ahead and get started if you're ready and and folks. Sure, anytime you want to start, that'd be fine. Okay, and and thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. And we have the pleasure of introducing Ronald Harrington. He's with the Bristol Bird Club. He's going to talk to us about hawk migration, and also uh, he, I believe, is the coordinator for some of the. Uh, the hawk watch activities that you may be aware of here in this part of the world. So yeah, I, coord uh, I coordinate the, yeah, I'm sorry, Phil, go ahead. Oh, that's okay, go ahead. Yeah, I coordinate the Mendo to Fire Tower Hawk Watch. Okay. And, right. and I've also yeah, established. And was, yeah. Okay. Well, a couple of our people are familiar with that, and I, I think uh, we've even participated, so. Good, uh, okay, yeah, that'd be great. Well, thank thank we, you for joining us this evening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, do I need to click on anything here? This meeting's being recorded thing. I need to click on that. It's on um, the front of my screen here. I, I think it, it. I think it may ask if you agree to that. If you're if you're fine with it, then you just approve. I'll just and, say got it or something like. That. Okay. Perfect. And I need to probably um, let's see hide the. Yes, I need to hide some things here. I need to move these out of the way right here because it's. It's going to get in my way. Can we delete those? No. See what I'm saying? Or, Is it the pictures of the people? Yes, the pictures of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go up to the top of the the pictures, I uh, got it. You, yeah. You can uh, that little hash mark. You can just click on it, and it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. I got a good memory. It's just getting short since I passed eighty. <laughs> okay. Now, can you? Hear me all right and see me okay? Yes, yes. I'm all right. Good. Good. Well, I'm really happy to be here and have this opportunity to talk about hawks. Uh, I really fell in love with hawks years ago when I started going up to the Mendota Fire Tower in the 1980s. I was just fascinated. And although I'm, a, I'm I, I do a lot of other birding and I take a lot take part in a lot of other birding activities, I just I felt like hawks was kind of taken the taken what went up to the top of the list and I. I've enjoyed uh, watching hawks ever since, okay? So um, what I'm planning to cover tonight is, is I wanna talk a little bit about the Mendota Fire Terror Hawk Watch in general, introduce you to that. And then I'm gonna talk about the raptor migration patterns of, of various raptors that you might see it at, uh, at your hawk site. And then I'm gonna focus on the broad-winged hawk migration uh, because 97% of the hawks we see are broad-winged hawks passing by the tower. And then uh, I want to talk up to a little bit about the Hawk Migration Association of North America. We submit our data to them. And uh, in connection with that, I'm going to talk about the results of the 2019 Raptor Population Index. And I'll explain all that later. And I want to talk, if we have time, about the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Broad-Winged Hawk Tracking Project, which um, was a project to track hawks using satellite telemetry and uh, it's very interesting, some of the uh, results that they came up with, okay? So let's move on. We'll talk about the Mendota Fire Tower Hawk Watch first. Folks started going up to uh, the Clinch Mountain near Mendota, Virginia in the 19, uh, around 1958 and started uh, counting hawks then. And I've been counting them off and on ever since. Uh, our 21 uh, season will start September 15th and run till the 30th. Our main problem up, our, up there is finding enough volunteers uh, to man the site. Uh, and uh, we just have to get, do the best we can and be there at the peak times when most of the hawks will be coming through. Um, this is an old building we set on up there. Uh, some of us get up on top of that. It gives us a little extra advantage uh, while we're hawk watching. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a hawk watcher that helped us for many years, Tom Hunter from Lebanon. Uh, he died, unfortunately, in 2015, and he helped to hook us up with the Hawk Migration Association of North America, and, and we really appreciate all that he did. He stayed for the whole month of September. He really put in his, his time up there, and we, miss, we sure miss him a lot. Um, this is a picture of the tower. Um, it's about 100 feet high, built in 1939, and um, we don't know for sure who built the tower, but uh, it's, it's, it, there's steps going up it, but they go on only as far as the broadband transmitters here that were put in in recent years. Here's that old building I was talking about we would sit on. And the view here is looking back down the flyway 
uh, going back toward uh, Gate City area and King Sports over this way. And um, we've, um, we've been, um, as I said, this is looking north along the flyway there. And as you can see, it's pretty rocky around the tower up there. So if you show up, be sure and bring you a chair or a cushion to sit on because it can be pretty, pretty hard on the dairy area up there. Here we're looking toward Rumley Mountain, Hidden Valley Wildlife Management Area here. And uh, we've, uh, in Levin would be over this way and back over this way would be toward Abingdon. It's probably about 12 miles as the crow flies up the, up the flyway here. And um, we have established an alternative site up on Brumley Mountain for folks who cannot um, uh, walk up the old tower road. Now you can drive pretty easily to the top of the mountain here. It's about three miles, as I said, from Mendota. But then you have to walk up the old tower road or up a backbone trail. Both are kind of tough. And a lot of folks with physical disabilities cannot hike up there. So I got uh, permission from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources to set up an alternate hike up a site up here where folks can just drive to uh, uh, and get out their chairs and the binoculars and watch hawks. And of course, we, we would have to give folks the key, the um, pass key password to this gate lock there, you know, the combination. And then uh, they can lock the gate behind them, come in and watch hawks out there. We watched out there last year because we did not have a hawk watch because of COVID. And we did see pretty good numbers of hawks. There are gonna be some morning hawks that are coming down on the east side of the mountain because the hawks here will, will roost on the east side of the mountain so, so they can catch the morning sun and get going pretty early if, the, if you have the right condition, weather conditions there. And up here on Bromley, it's pretty spread out where the towers are back there. We sit right behind the FAA tower where it's fenced in there and we cannot see over this east side of the mountain. So we'll miss some hawks, but if you want to just watch hawks, by nine or 10 o'clock, you should be able to see hawks coming by up there. Again, here's a, here's a view looking back toward um, Gate City and Kingsport on, on down the, uh, the southwestern uh, uh, flyway of the mountain here. Sometimes in early mornings, we'll see hikes down, uh, hawks down on this side of the mountain down there uh, early in the morning. And uh, that's another reason to be looking backwards here because sometimes you'll miss them when they first come up in the mornings and uh, you'll have to kind of be looking behind you a little bit, to make sure you, you've, you've got them as they come up. Here's our averages by species uh, since 2010. Uh, we've averaged about 21 osprey, 20 bald eagles, northern harriers about three, 32 sharp shin, um, cooper's hawk about 24, Northern goshawk, um, about one on the average, but that's kind of skewed because we had four each in 2012 and 2017. I'll talk a little more later about the go Northern goshawks, uh, particularly the, uh, the Northern goshawks that are in, uh, we used to be nesting in central Appalachia. Um, okay, and broadwing hawks, uh, a red-shouldered hawk, average of three, Broadwing hawks, about uh, 5,648 there. Red tails, 12. Now we don't count all the red tails because they don't normally migrate coming through, coming th they don't come through in migration until uh, later October and early November. But if it looks like one's migrating, we'll try to count them. But normally most of them we see uh, are not migrating. Golden eagles will average about one. We don't have many golden eagles. Kestrels, 10. Oh, sorry, I keep going the wrong direction here. Let me get back. All right, and um, Peregrine Falcons about seven. Maryland will average about 5.4 Maryland's there. And Mississippi Kite, that's one in 10 years. So I, that's, that's unusual. We normally don't see them up at the tower. And I think years ago, someone saw a, a scissor tail uh, kite, but I don't, I wasn't there when that occurred. And it certainly was not during the last 10 years. Unidentified raptors, you know, we just, well, we couldn't really identify them. Seven, so our overall average was about 5,796 uh, total. Our biggest year, and again, we have no records going back, I'm sorry, going back past 2010. The records have been lost. We don't know what happened to them, uh, but we do, Somewhere I found this, that uh, our biggest year was in 1968, where we had 25,000 
Hawks County that year. Our biggest day was 7,500. And I, I don't know what day of that year that occurred. Um, we've had some good days, of course, back in um, 2010, and I'll show you a little graph about that later. We had almost 10,000 broadwing hawks. So we had a real good year then. And, uh, and I'll show you the graphs from, from then on, okay. Uh, our effort up there, as you can see during Tom Hunter's reign up there, when he was coming the 1st of September and stay until the end, well, our average or much average hours of coverage, this means at least one person providing coverage at the tower. And of course, when he left, the, you know, the average coverage just went down. So it leaves our overall coverage down here of about uh, um, 1,347 hours there. And I can't see the average because of this is in the way. Can I move that by any chance? You can if you just click on it and, and uh, push it up with your, your cursor. You okay, to... gotcha. Okay, got you. I'll average 135 hours per session after that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We do have visitors at the tower. In addition to we, we have observers, and then we have an official counter. Uh, official counter is responsible for keeping the count, uh, recording the hours of, of of the observers when they came, when they left, and, and the weather conditions, uh, general observations about non raptors, and so forth and uh, also kind of helping keep up with our visitors. Uh, we do have college groups and high school groups show up. This year, we're not gonna have any high school students coming over because of COVID. Uh, this is a group here from, um, I believe this was from a uh, zoology class at uh, East NC State University. And here's a, a class from Emory and Henry College. This gentleman here is Steve Hopp. I don't know whether any of you know him or not. He's, now he's an expert on birding, really a good birder. And uh, I rely on him a lot to, when I have questions about things that I don't understand, he just I just called Steve and he, he uh, helped us with the uh, Christmas bird count. I, I coordinate the Glade Spring Christmas bird count. And I also participated in the Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas too, which was a breeding bird uh, a survey from 2016 to 2020. And Steve was the regional coordinator of that. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the results of that as, the, as it applies to hawks in a moment, okay? Um, a definition of migration. Migration is defined as a predictable twice annual movement between geographically separated breeding and non-breeding areas. And of course, as you'll see in a few minutes, that gets a little cloudy <laughs> trying to figure all that out because it's not really that clear. You do, it requires significant physiological expenditures, uh, meaning effort, you know, they gotta spend a lot of effort, physical effort to, uh, to travel by the individuals undertaking the movement and most individual in the, a population move. So that's kind of our baseline on what is meant by migration. So why do some map raptors migrate? Of course, about 45% of all raptor population migrate and the distance will vary according to species and how far they migrate, yeah, will we'll, we'll, we'll depend on a lot of factors. Um, in the fall, they rap, the raptors migrate from north to south, driven by the weather and scarcity of food. So the, the kind of the, the, the byline there, or the motto there is follow the food. That's what they're trying to do. Um, then in the springtime, they come back because of lower predator and parasite populations for breeding and longer days for hunting. And um, there are more, fo more food supplies, supplies and increase in breeding success in the temperate zone. And studies have shown that, that there is a higher breeding success to uh, birds breeding in, uh, in North America uh, and then those breeding in, in the, um, you know, on down in the uh, uh, Northern part of, of South America or in Central America. What triggers migration? Well, a lot of things are involved in that, of course. Um, one, and I think the main factor, and we'll talk about this is a big factor, of course, for broadwing hawks, decreasing day length in later summer inducing, induces what is known as migratory restlessness. And that's a German word for that, which I'm not good at German. I didn't study German, but I think it's pronounced sort of like Zung und Ruh. 
which means, you know, um, restlessness, migratory restlessness. And of course, you've got decreasing temperatures that are part of all this, decreasing food supplies, and of course, a genetic predisposition. And we'll talk a little more about um, all that in a few moments, okay? How do hawks navig navigate? Scientists, of course, are not really sure about that. Um, they, um, they look at the, um, at the things like maybe the hawks have internal GPS systems or some genetic makeup that helps them follow the same routes each year. Or maybe it's the sun. Maybe there's landmarks that they're looking at that regarding the sun. Um, senses that pick up the Earth's magnetic field, or it could be an olfactory map. Um, birds can get compass information from the sun, the stars, and by sensing the Earth's magnetic field. And they also get information from the position of the setting sun and from landmarks seen during the day. There's even evidence that sense the smell, that, that the sense of smell plays a role, at least for the homing pigeons. We don't know how that works with hawks, of course. Now, as far as long distance migration, uh, the experts say that while short distance migration probably developed from a fairly simple quest for food, the origins of long distance migration patterns are much more complex. Probably evolved over thousands of years and are controlled at least partially by the genetic makeup of the birds. And of course, they also, long distance migrants also incorporate responses to the weather, geography, food sources, day length, day length, and other factors, okay? Now, what are some of the migration strategies that birds are using? And uh, we're, we're gonna look at the uh, various strategies that they use. Relatively broad-winged hawks, or species, I mean, such as the eagles, vultures, and buteos, soar along updrafts and thermals to migrate long distances. Falcons, on the other hand, ospreys and harriers frequently use more active flapping flight. And we'll look at how that affects where, which way they go when they're, when they're migrating in a minute. Many raptors, including insipiters, use soaring and flapping flight. You, you're familiar with, of course, the insipiters that uh, their, flat, their flight pattern is flap, flap, sail, flap, flap, sail. And that's kind of what they do as they're going along. Diurnal raptors, of course, migrate during the day. Types of mag migration, uh, you've got your residents who normally don't migrate very far at all. They might move some for food purposes. The short distance migrants, then you got the medium distance migrants and the long dis distance migrants. Short distance, a good example, a non-hawk, non good example of a short distance migrant is elevation migrants. For example, the dark-eyed juncos that come down from higher elevations spend the winter here. Um, goshawks will tend to do that also. Adult goshawks will tend to um, just move to a higher or lower elevation as well. Medium distance migrants like the red-tailed hawks, for example, may move from one to several states. As, as, and long distance migrate, may travel for hundreds and hundreds or thousands of miles. So let's take a look at the individual birds and see what, we're, what we uh, want to look at there and what that might tell us. Red-shouldered hawk, uh, birds of the Northeast and the Northern Midwest migrate to more southerly states for the winter, while birds in Central and Southern states tend to migrate, although some red-shouldered red hawks do spend winters in Mexico. Um, I'm sorry. Birds in central and southern states don't tend to migrate, although some red-shouldered hawks do spend winters in Mexico. And out on the West Coast, the birds are mostly non-migratory. Our CBC records, uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking back at some of those, and we've not had many red-shouldered hawks during the Christmas bird count. We had one in 2016, one in 2010. But when you look at the Virginia breeding bird, survey from 2016 to 2020, there are numerous locations where it was confirmed that they were breeding in the state of Virginia. They, they red-tailed hawks or red-shouldered hawks typically migrate uh, alone, although some form small flocks of three or more birds. They have, like uh, the broad-winged hawks, they typically avoid crossing large bodies of water. Red-tailed hawk uh, they are resident or short distant migrant. 
let me move on if I had about it. I'm getting ahead of myself here. You can see the, the, um, the maps over here. Um, at, uh, they look at the breeding areas and the year-round locations. See, most of the red-tailed hawks are, are um, year-round residents in uh, most of the United States here. Um, most birds from Alaska, Canada, and Northern Great Plains, as you can see over here, uh, fly south for a few months in the winter, but remaining in North America. Birds across the rest of the continent typically stay put, sharing the countryside with northern arrivals. Most of these red-tailed hawks do not migrate into our area here until um, mid-October until early November. So if you want to see some pretty good flights of red-tailed hawks, you might want to come up uh, during that time frame. Okay, and they'll just come here and stay put, sharing the countryside uh, with the local red uh, red-tailed hawks. Okay, now Cooper's hawks are sh considered short to medium distance uh, migrants as well. They can be found uh, wintering over most of the continental United States. Uh, some birds migrate as far south as southern Mexico to Honduras. Uh, Virginia uh, um, breeding bird atlas show that they're confirmed breeding in Virginia. And of course, we do pick them up during the Christmas bird count. In 2020, we had nine uh, Cooper's hawks during the Christmas bird count. Sharp shin hawks, um, they are resident to a long distance migrant. You can see here the most of them, uh, the breeding, of course, they're breeding um, on up into Canada, into Alaska, some migration through the uh, southern uh, Canada, all into the northern Midwest there. And then some are uh, uh, year round residents down the Appalachians here and on out into the Rockies and on down in toward Mexico. Um, in North America, the tendency for them is to, um, in the Appalachian Mountains and the Western Mountains, they may uh, remain there year round where birds that breed in the northern U.S. and Canada leave the breeding grounds and may winter in the rest of the continental United States or migrate as far as southern Central America. Virginia uh, Breeding Bird Atlas showed uh, we had nine confirmed breeding in the whole state with one in Dickinson County. Uh, for the Christmas bird count, we counted three in 2020. American Kestrel, our smallest falcon, in North America, the tendency for kestrels to migrate decreases from north to south, uh, which means the northern birds tend to, to uh, migrate more than the southernmost populations because they tend to remain residents year round. Uh, some American kestrels will migrate to Central America, but the great majority spend the winter in Southern United States. The uh, Virginia uh, breeding, uh, the Christmas bird count, we counted uh, two, 49 in 2019. And good numbers were confirmed in the Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, and that was throughout the state of Virginia. Merlins, um, not normally seen during the uh, um, Christmas bird count, although we did find one back in 2010. No breeding confirmations in the state of Virginia during the uh, Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, they're a resident to a long distant migrant, the um, Tyga form of the, of the Merlin, which is the form we have in the East. These are like subspecies, like with the falcons, you know, some of the peregrine falcons, we have subspecies. The uh, taiga form migrates from the far Northern breeding grounds to the coastal and Southern US and as far as um, South as Ecuador, okay? And they um, will come through here sometime uh, if you see them, uh, Maryland's, you might see them uh, during mid-September to late September. Peregrine falcons, um, no breeding records in the last 55 years for the, for, I mean, no Christmas bird records. They did have two breeding records in Southwest Virginia during the uh, Breeding Bird Atlas II. Those, one of those I know was over near Brakes Interstate Park. There were 14 in Eastern Virginia that were confirmed breeding, okay? The peak of their migration through here would probably be mid-September 12th through the 22nd. Now the name Peregrine means wanderer and the Peregrine Falcon has one of the longest migrations of any North American bird, those that do migrate long distances. These are the tundra testing falcons 
that winter in South America, they may travel more than 15,500 miles in a year. And again, you can see here, because of the, the way they fly, they don't soar, they flap when they're flying, they use powered flight, they don't have to go around the Gulf of Mexico like broadwing hawks, which we'll look out later. They tend to fly right straight across the Gulf of Mexico, many of them do. Some will go around the Gulf here. As you can see, some of them fly through across Cuba, others go across uh, the Gulf of Mexico into Mexico itself. Thought that I just threw that in, I thought you'd find that interesting. An American bald eagle, um, for the Christmas bird count, will average, last, uh, we had about six or eight average lately. 2020, we counted eight. And the Virginia breeding bird atlas, there were numerous confirmed throughout the state of Virginia. Now they're considered a um, resident, a long distance migrant. And they have complex migration patterns, depending on their age, breeding location, and food availability. And the best time to find them at the uh, Mendota Fire Tower is the third or fourth week uh, in September. We do pick them up, put those up as you saw in the numbers back there. Golden Eagles, we, we see very few Golden Eagles at the Mendota Fire Tower. Uh, at the Christmas bird count, we had one back in 2016. Uh, no breeding records of Golden Eagles that were picked up by the Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas. This time to see golden eagles might be a little later than we man the tower over there. Uh, I know at Hawk Mountain, their best time up there is late October through early November. And of course, the northern breeders migrate up to thousands of miles to their wintering grounds. Southern pa pairs tend to be residents year round. Okay. Osprey, um, best time to see the osprey at uh, our Hawk Watches. Uh, early September through early mid-October. We do see them here in mid-September, but they'll be migrating on through up, on up through mid-October and, and through our area here. They're considered a resident to long distance migrant. They breed in North America and the ones that breed in, breed, uh, uh, in the northern part of North America tend to migrate to Central and South America for the winter with migration routes following broad swaths of Eastern interior and Western US. Best time is mid-September to early mid-October. Now there are a few uh, Osprey now that over, over winter in south, so, southern most of the United States, including parts of Florida and California. An Osprey may log more than 160,000 migration miles during its 15 to 20 year lifetime. Really fascinating. Here's kind of a satellite pictures of their migration. Was, um, Osprey were outfitted with satellite transmitters. See here, they just went right down, some of them went right down the land, over into the Atlantic, right across Florida, you know, through the Caribbean islands, Cuba and so forth, right on down into uh, uh, Northern Mexico as well. Interesting. Northern Harrier, uh, they're considered resident to long distance migrants. Now, ha Harriers are known as leapfrog migrants with individuals from northern breeding populations wintering further south and individuals from the southern breeding populations, I mean they leapfrog over them. Uh, Christmas bird count, um, we don't see many, but we did have three in 2020. The Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas, there were two confirmed breeding in the state of Virginia. Um, one was Augusta County, which was the closest, uh, and there was one over in eastern shore of Virginia as well. Okay, um, here's another picture, picture of a, um, this is a male uh, Northern Harrier. I love to see Northern Harriers. A lot of times you'll see them coming through kind of low and they'll come through the gaps and they got, they're, they're kind of wobbling a little bit like a turkey vulture, longer wings, uh, almost look like a turkey vulture in a way they have long wings, but uh, let me back up. One more time, you know, when you see here's a immature northern harrier. And one of the things you look for is this um, uh, upper covert white patch here. That's uh, distinct on all, all, um, all, all the uh, northern harriers. You see, there it is on the adult male as well. Northern goshawks, talk about that a few moments. It's an interruptive mi migrant, and um, some goshawk population in northern areas 
are believed to migrate regularly. But southernmost populations, for example, those populations are left in Pennsylvania, for example, um, and on up into the New England states, um, are considered to tend to be sedentary. The ones that are migrating might be mean you've had a good year and you may have some juveniles migrating as well. And the Eastern United States um, uh, used to have a trend where they, might, they thought that they erupted every 10 years and that was cause of the rise and fall of the snowshoe hare populations. And those were uh, started being observed as, uh, way back in the 1800s. And these occurred normally once a decade. But most recent large scale eruptions of goshawk in the East have not occurred. There have been none observed since the early season of 1972 and 1973. There apparently was um, not a crash uh, after that of the populations and therefore they, uh, they were just explaining the lack of eruptions of goshawks since then. Snowshoe hares are found in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, but are only present in isolated areas of Highlands County in Virginia. Okay. Now the goshawk flight um, is relatively protracted at Hawk Mountain. If you wanted to see uh, goshawks migrating up there it would be late September to early December and a peak in um, early, uh, I'm sorry, late November, okay. Goshawks normally migrate alone and during the daytime, okay. Okay, let's move right along. Uh, here's the guy that was doing a study of the um, uh, the goshawks in central Appalachia. He initiated what is known as the Central Appalachian Goshawk Project, 1994. He was a regional ecologist with the Natural History Program at the Merlin Department of Natural Resources, David Brinker. And his conclusion was after all these years of study that Central Appalachian and Northeastern United States, Northern Goshawk population is declining. Breeding population has retracted from West Virginia uh, Mon Monongahela Mount, uh, well, National Forest, and in Maryland as well, and into central and northern Pennsylvania. Decline appears rooted in demographic challenges rather than habitat change. And this is a little different explanation of it. Uh, he, he depended on all indices, including breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird counts, and migration counts showing declines in central Appalachia and the northeast eastern uh, states significant decline since about 1999. You really don't know what it is. There are further studies required. It has to do with birth rates declining, death rates uh, in, uh, increasing. So, and, and the population mix is shifting. A uh, good population mix for growth would be about an equal amount of adults and sub-adults and juvenile, but that's not occurring. The latest survey he, he looked at showed uh, a, large, a large percentage of adults but a very low percentage of uh, non-adults, uh, the um, sub-adults and the juveniles. Is it due to loss of prey, or predation, or what? And he doesn't really know yet. Uh, goshawks also rely on mature, mature forest and may be vulnerable to nest disturbance, environmental contaminants, climate change, and habitat loss and disease. Okay, so let's focus on the, the broad wing hawks here for just a few minutes. Um, I think um, I throw this. I threw this up on the left. It's from the Book of Job, and it tells us one thing. It tells us people have been noticing hawk migrations for a very long time. No one knows for sure when the Book of Job was written, but it's estimated to maybe be as, as old as thirty five hundred to four thousand years old. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom, and stretch her wings toward the south? Job thirty nine twenty six. Here we see an adult broad wing with the bands in its in its. Uh, wings, here, uh, tails here, and the block, uh, broad, and I'm sorry, the black outline around its wings, light wings, uh, and of course the, the um, rusty brown coloration here, the horizontal barring here, as opposed to the vertical barring on the uh, immature, more whiter looking wings and a little thinner black bands on the uh, trailing edge of the wings. And of course, you don't have the, the uh, wide, wide bands in the tail there as well. And again, here's another look at the broad wing hawk, okay. Um, this is their range map. Um, you see their bird of mostly Eastern North America uh, on into the Southern Canada, all the way over to uh, Alberta. And this just goes, shows some of the migration patterns. 
they all migrate, of course, to Central and South America, with the exception of some birds that may, I'd stay in Southern Florida, mostly juveniles, and are now finding there are also some birds staying in the Gulf Coast area, particularly in Louisiana. And again, here's the uh, here's the map again showing their breeding range. Uh, I wanted to flip out to you there. Uh, just a couple things about them. I'm not going to go over all this because you can look all this up. They're a, the smallest of Budios, crow size, um, and they're uh, they soar the wings held fat, taper into a point, and they glide with the wings leading edge uh, curved with the trailing edge edge straight. This is called the the uh, paring knife look that they have. They're considered a complete migrant long distance, but again, we've seen there are some exceptions to that. That as my, when they migrate, they form large flocks, and unlike all the other raptors, and they have a concentrated flight. It comes together eventually as they're migrating along. Um, solitary and so territorial. And of course, they, uh, they prefer deciduous or wi mixed woodlands for their um, breeding. And they also prefer their similar habitat, as we'll see in, in a little while, when they're migrating and also when they have their stop odors during migrating. Average lifespan is about 12 years. Oldest one on record that I could find was 18 years, four months old. Monogamous, um, but you know that's again some skeptics to that. Pairs usually stay together more than one breeding season. They breed between April and August and raise one brood. Okay, um, let's see. I wanted one more thing I wanted to say here. Sorry. Um, during the late the late Pleistocene age, fossils have been found dating back four hundred thousand years. They've been unearthed in Florida, Iowa, Illinois, Virginia, and Puerto Rico. So. You can see these hawks have been around a while. You can see why that's gotten, that pattern of their migration kind of got into the, their DNA there. World population is estimated at 1. million. Estimated population in the United States is about a million, okay? I, I, I just finished reading this book, The Wright Brothers, and I came across several quotes about birds. They studied birds extensively in trying to design their flight craft, particularly their, their uh, gliders. And I just thought this was an interesting, quote, no bird soars in a calm. And you can kind of think about that and think about what that might mean. We'll, we'll maybe reference that a little later. Uh, he's, they said, Vil Wilbur said, the desire to fly is an idea handed down to us by our ancestors who look enviously at, on the bird soaring freely through space on the infinite highway of the air. Looked at around 1901. So how do bird wings hawks migrate? They're one of only five Northern, North American raptors that are considered, but that in quotes, complete migrants. You got the broad winged hawk, you got the Swainson's hawk, uh, you've got the uh, osprey, and you've got the, I mean, um, you've got the uh, swallowtail kite, and you got the Mississippi kite. Those are the ones that are generally considered. Again, all of those kind of hang out in certain parts of. North America now and some are thinking that may be related to climate change where it's getting a little warmer they don't need to go as far and I think part of it's the juveniles get a little lazy laid back and don't travel as far. Reduced energy costs of long distance migration they're not built to travel long distances uh, by flapping their wings. Of course they have to capitalize on mountain updrafts and thermals for soaring and they allow themselves to be drifted by prevailing winds. And when they first start off, they start off on a broad front and then gradually kind of come together. And when they're in early in their migration, they'll allow winds to move them here and there. And because they're in a hurry, if one mountain range is socked in or weather's got them blocked in one way, they may drift over to another mountain range. Uh, I've been up to the tower and the, uh, the tower was socked in. And uh, Tom Hunter and I one time went down to the bridge here on the North Fork of the Holston River and the knobs were clear. And we saw hawks migrating through the knobs that day while the mountain was completely socked in. So that just tells you they're in a hurry. They're going to travel if at all possible. And of course, they travel in flocks called kestels, kettles, which aids in orientation and navigation. They average about 100, I'm sorry, they average about 50 to 130 miles per day, traveling anywhere from 1,900 miles to over 6,300 miles to their destination. And the fall migration averages anywhere to 89 
count it to, to 90 days, okay? That's the dates from where they, when they first leave to the latest, the last ones that are leaving their nesting ground. So there's pretty long, big range there of their uh, the migration uh, days they're leaving. And of course, here's a little uh, graph or drawing showing the, the updrafts hitting the sides of the mountains. And of course, you want winds that are favorable for updrafts when you're going up to, the, to your sites uh, to watch the migration. Then you've got the thermals, which are forming. Thermals form over un, when heating, the heating occurs unevenly over the, over the earth. Heating does not form unevenly over open water. So uh, the birds that rely on thermals and even updrafts will not normally migrate over open waters. They might go shopping short distances, but they don't migrate over large bodies of water. But the hawks that um, we watch up at the Mendota Fire Tower are relying on both updrafts and the thermals to keep them going up there. Now, kettles of hawk or groups of hawks traveling together are called kettles. And I guess that name came from the fact that they're swirling around on a thermal and they uh, sort of uh, thought, well, that looks like water boiling in a kettle and it boils over at the top when they reach the top of the thermal, you know, thermal starts uh, dissipating. They boil off the top and then go on down the mountain range from there. So that's why one reason it's called a kettle. Kettles help um, the hawks to locate the thermals, of course. They'll see other hawks in the kettle and will join that. Uh, let me back up again, read it. Um, it aids in orientation and navigation, especially for the juveniles. Helps the juvenile birds take advantage of favorable atmospheric conditions and reduce the extent they fly off course. And they tend to fly off course when they're first migrating, when they're young. And that tells you a little bit the fact they're going to learn from landmarks and other factors, position of the sun and other things, in addition to their built-in compass that they have. Adults are more likely to flock and are usually the lead birds in mixed age flocks as well. Uh, here's a picture of uh, mostly adults. I don't think there's any juveniles in this one. In a thermal here. Here's a, even a better picture of showing them migrating, going around and around in the thermal. You also have some uh, turkey vultures in this particular thermal. And here's one immature in the thermals as well. You see, he's kind of in a glide or something. He's got his wings crooked sort of in that uh, pairing knife look. The rest of them have got the wings spread out to a point and their tails can be broad and wide as they're circling up here. And you, you ask the question, how do you count them in a, in a kettle like that? We don't. We wait till the first hawk sails off of the kettle at the top. When he comes off that kettle, heads on down the mountain range, it's when we start counting as well. When do they migrate? They're one of the first of the birds, first hawks to leave their meeting grounds in the fall. And one of the first, one of the first, one of the last to return in the spring. Fall, uh, early migration might range from August to mid-November. Spring uh, might range from March to May. And now there's some wider variations of this. If we have time, we'll look at uh, when we look at the, um, um, the a study that was done at Hawk Mountain. The early and compressed fall migration then is a result of their dependence on thermals. They must leave, leave as soon as possible when thermal activity is the most predictable. They gotta get out of Dodge. And here shows the peak time when they're coming through here, uh, which is a uh, Hawk Mountain. It's generally about the 15th of September. We're a little later than that, about the 20th to 21st of September. You can see in the peak there. And some of their big days were like uh, 16th of September, 1948. They had 11,349 hawks uh, uh, in one day, uh, 10,000 on 14th of September, 1978. We don't normally have that big a day. So we get maybe 12, 1,200 to 2,000 maybe in one day. Here's the uh, bell-shaped curve showing the peak um, going over here to looking at Ontario birds. Obviously, they're peaking uh, earlier when they uh, come through uh, leaving Ontario. And when you're looking at sites, say, in Virginia here, looking at middle of September, these, this is green. I hope you can see that. And then, of course, Mexico is the yellow. Uh, Texas is called the blue color, kind of in a mix up here. They're peaking probably down there, maybe the 1st of October, and, and, uh, and those sites down there, and then that drops on off to around uh, after, the, after the 15th of October when they're, they're out of Dodge and are well into Central America and on in going into South America as well. 
And I'm just going to show you this. This is a spring migration uh, when birds are coming back. Derby Hill in New York State is considered probably the, the best spring raptor migration site. It's called Derby Hill My Bird Observatory. And you can see the peak time for the broad wings here getting back there is about the middle of April, down into the end of May, okay? And you got some other species like the red-tailed hawk kind of flattens out here, March and April. We did kind of want to share that with you. They're located right about here well, on the, what is considered probably the, uh, the northeastern, or I mean, southeastern end of, uh, of Lake Ontario where they're migrating through here. They don't, again, cross the lake here. They don't cross large bodies of water. Uh, interesting, uh, this is lo located near a town called Mexico, New York, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Okay, what's the best time to see hawks at the actual hawk sites themselves? Of course, first of all, you've got to pick a time of year when the hawks that you're wanting to see, like the broadwings, are likely to be there. So this is the middle of September, okay? Uh, most observations of migrating hawks occur between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, you're normally going to not see thermals forming until at least 8 o'clock. We normally see them building up a little better around 9, and they tend to, tend, tend to start dissipating around 5 o'clock. And if there's th a strong wind, raptors may begin migrating at dawn and fly until dusk. And, um, Typically, most birds are seen between 9 and 3 p.m. Again, that'll vary. We've seen some large kettles of hawks at 5 o'clock in the evening, and uh, I think one of the largest seen late in the day was around 6 o'clock. I wasn't at the tower. I was up at Bromley that day, and around 5 o'clock saw over 500 come through, and about 1,200 was seen out over the valley at the Mendota Fire Tower. So you can't always go by these guidelines, okay? Um, but anyway, um, coastal land traps, you know, land trap, you know, is a place that has favorable conditions uh, like, uh, you know, food or wind conditions or uh, ge geographical conditions for hawks to accumulate like Cape May, New Jersey is considered a land trap or a hot spot, hawk migration hot spot. Uh, land traps such as Lighthouse Point, Connecticut, Cape May, New Jersey more likely to see numbers of hawks moving very early, even late in the day. If you ever happen to go up there, I've never been there. You might see good numbers of hawks at any time of day, but you're likely to see the best numbers later in the morning, early in the afternoon. Again, if you want to see hawks closer up, the best time to, to come to the Mendota Fire Tower would be um, earlier in the morning, particularly after the thermals get out, or if you got wind, they could be riding the, the, uh, uh, the updrafts from the wind, and late in the day because you'll get to see a, a, a get a closer look at them. By nine o'clock, if there's a good thermals, you'll get to see them out at about uh, straight out from you. Uh, by 10 o'clock, they're up higher. And by noon, they're straight overhead. And by one or two o'clock, they may be disappearing. They may be completely out of sight. Because those hawks are going to ride those thermals as high as they're going to take them. And that might be another 3,000 feet above the mountain. The elevation at the mountain up there is about 3,000 feet. And so you're going to see them uh, up there very, very high if you got good eyes or you got a backdrop. And if you're lucky with your binoculars picking them up. But if it's a real clear day, and we call that a high sky day, you may have trouble seeing them at all. And if you do see them, you might not see them until they break out right overhead, which means that's when they're closer to you. You're not going to see them further out there. Also, that hot air is, is disguising them. You know, you, you remember looking down a highway you see those hot, hot air coming off of the road and it's, it's uh, disrupting the image of, image of a car coming out there. Same thing's happening with the, with, with the hawks up there and you'll experience that. So anyway, good luck on seeing them in the afternoon on a very hard day. I hope you can. But uh, I saw, we saw some good, uh, good uh, flights one time up there. I remember it was about two o'clock in the afternoon and we were able to lay on our backs, look straight up and see them going straight over. So. Anyway, and the effects of weather at the tower, um, you know, you got to go at a time when you're most often, most likely to have, uh, you know, uh, clearing up up there. You don't want to go when the mountain socked in, obviously, or if it's a foggy morning and it's fogged in, but the weather's predicting clearing up, you might not need to go there until about 11 or 12 o'clock. 
Um, but anyway, pick, pick a day when it looks like you're going to have thermals or a favorable wind blowing so you can get them uh, 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 with, with, with the lift that you, you need in order to see them because they're, they're not going to fly when the mountain socked in. And of course, we all know in the fall, a typical good flight day, this is true for any site, is the day of and or the day after a cold front passes through the area. This is true all up and down the Appalachian Range. Um, once that gets through and starts clearing up, I've been up on days when it was breaking up and uh, I, I was up there one day in the afternoon when the front was breaking up and it's starting to clear up. And about four o'clock I saw the wind was blowing pretty good out of the Northwest. And I looked up and there were still some clouds here and there. Here come a bunch of hawks and they were, they were facing into the wind but riding right along the mountain range. They were riding on that wind coming out of the Northwest. And each hawk site, as, you, as we know, has a different set of weather conditions that produce the best flights. But I know over at your site over there at Birch Knob, you'll probably have similar conditions to us because of the way the, way the mountain ranges run over there. Uh, Broadwing hawks will like, they do like tailwinds, uh, not, a, not a real strong one. You get a wind out of the, of the northeast coming right down the mountain range, they'll, they'll ride out. But they normally don't like to fly against the wind, particularly a wind coming out of the south west. We've normally found that's not favorable. Maybe if it's a good hot day and it's very light breeze, yes. Uh, of course, other birds like the Peruvian falcons use parrot flight. Eagles seem un unfazed by strong winds, but they do prefer a good tailwind. Uh, let's move on and, and look at the Hawk Migration Association of North America, North America. I'm rushing right along here. I'm coming up on the end of my time. I do like the one I'll just point out. Maybe we can cover the um, Raptor Population Index. Uh, most of you may be familiar with the Hawk Migration Association of North America. Founded in 74, nonprofit organization committed to the conservation of raptors through the scientific study, enjoyment, and appreciation of raptor migration. They maintain a database for site profiles of over 200 sites throughout the United States. Uh, and about 134 of those are fall, 57 are spring, and I think there's a couple that are both. And they have flyways here, Eastern, Central, Western, Gulf, and Pacific. We're part of the Eastern Flyway. We're one of 27 sites in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, they have online reporting systems you can go to and look at their data. Just go to hawkmountain.org to get the data here that you want to look at and then click on our site. Click on the state of Virginia, click on, click on North America, state of Virginia. You click on the little icon near King's Kingsport and then you can find, uh, find our hawk site there. They maintain these other things called bird hawk, which is an online email list. I don't take that. And they got, of course, the, they're the driving force behind the raptor population index. Of course, if you want to conserve raptors, you've got to know as much about them as possible. And why study raptors? Of course, their ability to survive is threatened. They uh, serve as the barometer of eco ecological health uh, of their environment because they're an indicator species. They're at the top of the food line, food chain, I should say. Um, there are about 450 species of raptors worldwide. We have um, about 34 species of diurnal raptors in the United States, about 20 nocturnal ones. They're more vulnerable then to threats from pesticides, habitat loss, and climate change. And they do provide a cost-effective way and an efficient means to, de in, to detect environmental threats. Now the RPI was launched in 2004. It was a collaborative effort to understand and share trends in conservation stab status for migratory raptors in North America. And of course the RPI team analyzed data every three years using multiple data sets. They use Christmas bird counts, migration counts, and breeding bird surveys. And you can see the organizations are affiliated up there. And the 2000, 2019 update represented 43,000 observation hours, 8,897,000, or rounded off to 8,899 million raptors counting. There were 75 qualifying sites that their data got included. Ours, here's the, the way that RAPT RPI is broken down as far as uh, the uh, North America, or at least the United States is concerned, the East, the Central, the West and the Gulf Coast here. And the most of the sites, as you can see, are in the east here. 
we're not included. Uh, the Rockfish Gap, the Hanging, Hanging Rock Tower. Um, my, uh, there was another place, um, Snickers Gap, um, and others up the line there that were included, but we were not. And here's the criteria to be included. You have to have 10 years of data, which we did have. You have to submit our data to hopcount.org, which we did. You have to use a standard protocol, which we did. But to include it, of course, the, uh, well, we, we did include the ones that qualified, like the species had to be detected on at least 50% of the survey years. For example, the goshawk would have not been included. Count for, for at least, you had to count for at least 75% of the migration season. 30, 35 days in the spring, which we do not count in the spring, 40 days minimum in the fall, which we do not, and a minimum of five hours per day on the average for those 40 days. So that was the reason we were not included. And of course, the results of the 2019 index, looking at 25 species, showed that 65% of the species were stable, 22% showed a decline, and 11% showed an increase. And here's another picture, one of my favorites, the goshawk, or they used to be called the goosehawk. You can't see this, and I apologize. I took a lot of these slides from the presentation I attended. Just look at the largest piece of the pie here, of course, the sharp shin hawk, and of course, your red tail hawk, which we'll talk about in a minute, and uh, northern, my northern harrier, and the American kestrel. Cooper's hawk were the largest one. We'll look at them from a different perspective here. The 2000-2009 raptors at risk, sharp shin hawk with the top of the list with 48% or 37 of the sites, um, um, had, including them, okay? And then they had the northern goshawk that was, um, they had 46% uh, of the total sites. Uh, nine rough-legged hawks, 43% of the total sites. And then you had 30 sites, 43% of the sites by rough-legged hawk. And red tail was fourth. Fifth was the Northern Harrier. Osprey was sixth. Um, Cooper's hawk was seventh. And I'm sorry, went too fast here. And then the um, American Kestrel was eighth on the list there, okay. So the sites that showed declines, here was it said 48% here at the top with 22% uh, showing declines with the American Kestrel. Hope it didn't confuse you on that. Now going back another 10 years and coming through 2019, somewhat similar, rough-legged hawk took the top of the list which we don't have at the Mendota Fire Tower. We never see them there. If you want to see rough-legged hawks, go to Burke's Garden in the winter, and oftentimes you can see them up there. Northern Goshawk took the top of the list here with 10% of the height sites um, showing uh, uh, there was a decline there. Um, I mean, 10, 10 of the sites, 63% showing decline. American Kestrel, 61% or 22 sites had declines. 53% of the uh, sites had red tail clines, declines, declines. 50% showed sharp shin declines. 47% northern hair declines. I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Uh, and osprey, 34% declines. 32% had red shoulder hawk declines. 29% Cooper's hawk declines, okay? So what does all that mean? Uh, well, we're gonna look at the increases first here. As you can guess, the number one was the bald eagle, 79% of the sites showing increases, 23 of the 29 sites. Turkey vultures also showed increases, 63% uh, of the sites. Mississippi kite, 60% uh, of the sites showed increases, wasn't a large number there, but uh, peregrine falcon, 50% 50 50 increase, or 15 sites, and the black vulture, 39% of the sites, or five, had increases. So there's the species that were showing increases. Really no surprises, particularly with the bald eagle, peregrine falcon, after their recovery from um, the uh, 
uh, pesticides, particularly the DDT. Although the bald eagle is facing challenges from uh, lead shot and, uh, and of course, um, and the lead poisoning is being shown up in the bald eagles because they're the top of the food chain. I'm not sure what the, what is going on with the peregrine uh, falcons as far as that goes, okay? Um, one of the things that um, early, they early, they are, their RPI folks early on realized that they weren't getting the real picture by just looking at migration data. Uh, so there was a study that occurred back in February, 2017, uh, which said that what they found out and they looked at um, red tail hawks and the survey said that a fall count, migration counts only can cause scientists to miss the trends in the bigger picture. So re these researchers combined red tail hawk counts with both migration and winter Christmas bird count data uh, to show that the hawk numbers were stable overall and their migratory behavior is undergoing a change. You can see here from the map, see all the, the, the downward trends in the number for the migration here. The blue is little, is, is stable. I looked at all these downward trends for the migration for red-tailed hawks. They first looked at that, and they also looked at the Christmas bird count up here in, in um, Alberta, I mean, I'm sorry, Ontario. And they said, gosh, what's happening to red-tailed hawks? But when they got to looking at these other stable locations here, and of course the winter count showed that, that they um, were increasing. Okay, I think we, I think we lost Ron. Yeah, it's, he's froze here too. So maybe he'll be able to log back on real quick. That, that's a really good talk. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he said that this had happened once before that he was, uh, he got kicked off. He wasn't sure why, but uh, I, I think he was near the end. So if he's got extra information, we could probably just put that in a, uh, in an email. Okay. We'll give him a second here. To... Well, I have learned a lot and I, I was highly impressed with his talk. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, anybody have questions that we can can share with Ron? If he doesn't get back in, we can always email. And then uh, I think I've got contact information for most of you on here. So if you have a question for Ron, and assuming he doesn't come back on, you can put that in the chat box, and we'll be sure to get that to him, and then um, get an answer to everybody who's here tonight. I was kind of shocked at how low some of the counts were for, for some of the species. I, I would have thought they would have seen more than that, but um, you know, that makes me appreciate the ones that I have seen even more. Hey, that doesn't look like he's, he's getting like, I'll give him a call here in a second. Uh, and I don't see any questions coming in, so uh, so we can go ahead and close down, I guess. But thank you all for for logging in tonight. And the next one coming up, I believe, Thursday evening. And Shad, that is Rick Besson with the Fall Insect Invaders. Okay. He is the uh, state entomologist for Kentucky. Yeah, that's he's a he's always a good speaker, very knowledgeable. 
so that's Thursday evening, and uh, and we'll go ahead and close it down. But uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon.